Good morning. Friends, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Let us be glad in it. It's good to see you as we gather for worship this day. I was prepared with the weather forecast to commend you for getting here in the rain, but then it turned out to be this beautiful fall day. And so we get to gather here and worship God in this wonderful place. Uh, if you are a guest today, we hope that you experience God's presence in this place. My name is Gray Norsworthy. I'm serving as the interim pastor in this time of transition. I'd love to meet you at the end of the service if you are a guest today. For those of you who are watching online, we too hope that you would feel God's presence in your place, wherever you may be. Uh, notice, note that you are, you are missed, and if you are able to be a part of our worship service here, we hope you will find a way to come join us when you can. We are entering the season of Advent. Uh, it's not yet Christmas, but in the church it's the season of Advent. We're starting to decorate around the church to give you a little hints of that. Our worship service is focused on Advent. We'll be talking about themes like hope and love and joy and peace. And to start us off, I would like to have two of our youth, Jack and Finn McCabe, to come lead us in our Advent candle litany that is found there in your bulletin. says all is lost. God says all is loved. The darkness says the light is dying. The light says the fire is catching. Fear says cover your eyes and your ears. Hope says wait, watch, and listen. As we light our first Advent ca candle, come now, O child of Mary. Salvation is near to us. Let us then lay aside the tatters of sin and put on the armor of righteousness, asking our Savior for forgiveness. So soon, God, too soon, we are hardly picked up from Thanksgiving, and here it is, Advent, with Christmas coming soon. So soon, it is hard to shift gears so fast. We are not ready. Where did the time go? How could the year pass so soon? Yet it is into such a world as this and such a time as this 
that you choose to enter. Again and again, you visit us in the darkest of light. Again and again, you surprise us in the midst of hectic schedules and frantic lives. Holy God, help us keep alert in this Advent season. Help us be ready to see you in the midst of ordinary tasks. Help us be ready to slow down for prayer for children, for our family and friends. Help us be ready to stand up for peace and justice. For Jesus comes to bring new life to us and our world. Oh God, help us be ready to receive you again. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer and forgive us. Beloved, know this, the God of presence, the God of transformation, the God of peace hears our prayers and gives us power to love. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. God sent Jesus into the world as the Prince of Peace, so we can be reconciled to God and we can be reconciled to one another. We can be peacemakers with one another. In passing the peace, we are beginning to practice that with each other here as a way to remember to do it when we get out there. So first I'm going to ask you this phrase and have you respond, and then afterwards I'm going to invite you to find someone. You can use this phrase, you can tell them good morning, but when you do that, find somebody you don't know and pass the peace. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. I invite you to share the peace of Christ. You're getting to be really good peacemakers in here, so that's a good thing. I want to invite our uh, young disciples or anybody who's young at heart to come join me down front for my time with them. You want to come up closer? Come here. Corey, you, you want to come up closer or are you fine there? All right. Good morning. Good to see you. All right, we got some more coming down. Come on, it won't be the same without you. And we, we can see if Dad can sit on the floor. Well, more we can see if Dad can get up after he sits on the floor, too. So uh, we've been saying a phrase we taught everybody to say along with us. Let's see if you recall that. You know what? What? God loves you and God loves me. Well, officially, it's begun. It's that time of year. Some call it kind of the the Christmas preparation period or the countdown. You probably see it on all the TV ads on your screens. Christmas is coming, that's right. And you'll see things that'll say like days until Christmas, 27 shopping days or 23 shopping days. Have you all seen that? And you've probably already started thinking about what you want to do for, for Christmas as well. And we have the 12 days of Christmas, which actually come after Christmas, but I'll talk about that in a different time. 
That's right. So do you see anything in here that helps us think that Christmas might be coming? Anything in here? Looks like Christmas? Yes. Yeah. The wreaths, that's right. These wreaths are around. And the Advent candles, that's right. We started off lighting the Advent candles. Advent is a word that means coming. Well, the big wreath up there with the pine cones on it. Yeah, the one back there, too. You are so right with that, too. And so we look forward. Now, whose birth happens on Christmas? Jesus died. Jesus' birthday does it. And yours is two, two days after Christmas. Uh, and your friend's birthday is on Christmas, along with Jesus, who is your friend too, right? Yeah, and everybody's your friend, actually. That's right. Everybody's your friend, actually. Those are all good things, too. That's right. That's right. Well, one of the things we talk about, and we're going to talk about today, is we're going to talk about hope. And we're going to talk about what it means to have hope. And one of the things I think hope is when we look forward to a day when something will be good or will be better than it is now. We hope for it. And some say it's like standing on tiptoes. Can you stand on your your tiptoes? Can you show us? Look at that. It's almost like we're standing on tiptoes looking for when the time when Christmas comes, not just for the presents, but we celebrate the birth of Christ as well. So that's what we... It's about hanging out with your family too. Hanging out with your family is a great way to celebrate it. Those are all good things, too. So I hope that you'll remember that as we think about Christmas, that it's a time of hope. Yeah, you can get off your tippy toes because y'all can do that forever. I'm very impressed with that, too. All right, would you join with me with a prayer? Let's bow our heads. Gracious God, thank you for Jesus, the hope of the world. Help us look forward to celebrating his birth and the peace that he brings. And the peace that he brings. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can go with Miss Marina or you can return to your seat with your parents. This morning, just cel- I want to uh, share with you a few celebrations, announcements, and concerns of the church. Um, first of all, um, I want to update you on our stewardship campaign. Uh, actually, the numbers, they're a little better than what are listed in there. We are up to 82% of last year's total. Uh, this includes uh, two new pledges, 18 increases, 56 so far. I think our total is about 490. So, if you have not had a chance to give, we would love for you to join those who have already uh, made a pledge for next year. You can do it. There are pledge cards in the back. You can mail it in the church office. You can do it online. There are many, many options. But if you can do that as soon as you can, it helps us plan for what we can do through this church in the next year. For all of you who have already made a pledge, thank you. Thank you for your generous giving. We cannot do it without you. Uh, Last week, we talked about the Thornwell offering, the turkeys, and so hopefully you either got an envelope or you filled out or you completed your, you filled your turkey with coins and bills. You can leave those in the offering plate or when the offering plate is passed. Thank you for that, and if you haven't done that, we encourage you to do that. That goes to help the wonderful work that they do to help children, to care for children who have a place to live that is safe when they don't have that in life. The ditty bags, there are ways in there that you can help support uh, the homeless, care for the homeless, read about what our folks are doing with that. And the poinsettias, uh, the order form is in there too. So those of you who want to purchase a Christmas poinsettias, we encourage you to do that. The deadline is December 15th. Those are all of our celebrations and concerns of the church. Just know that listed in there are prayer concerns in your insert. Please remember those folks in our church family. Keep them in your thoughts and your prayers. We have a great privilege to come together as the people of God and to pray for our world, which is in need of prayer and help. So let's join together as we pray. Gracious God, a few days ago many of us celebrated Thanksgiving. Some of us tried to live out last week's admonition to choose gratitude over grumbling. We thank you, Lord, when we were able to focus on gratitude and thanksgiving. 
And Lord, when we slipped into grumbling, we pray that our words didn't cause too much hurt or damage, but help us to remember that you are there and that you are always a God of forgiveness and grace. And if it's within our power, help us to seek the forgiveness of others and make things right. As we reflect on the events of the past week, Lord, there were still more shootings, and it grieves us. Sometimes we feel at a loss to try to put an end to these senseless events. Lord, help us to do what we can to prevent things like this from happening, even if it may be difficult and unpopular. And Lord, as the days get shorter and the darkness comes earlier each evening, we see our moods and outlooks affected by the winter weather. So as we enter this season of Advent, a season where we seek to bring light to the darkness, hope to the hopeless, and peace where there seems to be a great deal of unproductive conflict, Lord, empower us with the power of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, who came as the Prince of Peace. Help us to follow his example as we hold on to the hope in the light of Christ. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus the Christ, whose birth we remember and anticipate during this season, who taught his disciples to pray, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, it is your generous giving that enables us to make a difference in our world in so many ways. Thank you for your generous giving. And now let us prepare our hearts as we bring to God our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings.
Beloved, know this, the God of presence, the God of transformation, the God of peace hears our prayers and gives us power to love. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let me first commend you on singing a hymn that many of you have probably never heard before. Is that correct? You did well. Advent has some really uh, interesting music. We're not at Christmas carols yet. We will get to those. But I commend you for hanging in there. And the, the, the hymn we just sang was actually the passage we're going to read put to music. So you're going to hear it read in just a moment when we read Scripture, and then you're going to hear me preach about it. So by the end of the day, you're going to know this passage very, very well. I also want to thank our music. Um, Morrow, as many of you know, is filling in on doing double duty on both uh, the organ and leading the choir. So we thank you for that, and thank you, choir, for holding it down for us during our transition period. Our music search committee is working hard and has some good folks to look at. We're even going to meet today, so keep them in your thoughts and your prayers. Our scripture this morning is from Luke 1, 26 through 38. It is a, an Advent reading. As I read this, listen for God's word. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, 
for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who is said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you join with me in prayer? Holy God, as we hear and even sing this story that's familiar to many of us, if we're paying attention, it is also filled with many questions and mysteries. So we pray that you're, by your Spirit you will help these familiar words speak to us in ways that we need to hear so that we can hear of your hope for the world. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. So today we are beginning a new sermon series for Advent that we are calling The Four Love Stories of Christmas. The Four Love Stories of Christmas. Now when it comes to Christmas love stories, we may first think of something we may see uh, this time of year, uh, perhaps on the Hallmark Channel. Um, Around our house, Hallmark Christmas movies are often um, a refreshing change to the bad news and the chaos found on many of the other TV channels. Now, I have to admit um, that these movies do not often have the most complex storylines. Actually, for most of the movies, uh, the plot is pretty much the same. Uh, Here's a spoiler alert. If you don't want to know the plot, you can plug up your ears. But this is what happens in almost every movie. In a small town, they are celebrating Christmas, and um, either a a stranger or or someone who grew up in the town arrives, but they've moved away to have success in the big city. But when the person comes to town, he or she rediscovers the, the real meaning of Christmas and of life. And also, they usually fall in love with someone local, and the two live happily ever after. That's it. That's the plot of most Hallmark Christmas movies. And while that may be the storyline that comes to mind when we think of Christmas love story, that's not exactly what happens in these four stories from Luke's gospel that we plan to look at this Advent. However, I think our four love stories of Christmas are actually more complex and deeper and relevant to our lives today and to our world. Luke begins this first love story about the angel Gabriel telling Mary that she will have a child in a unique and miraculous way. And Luke begins by grounding this story in place and in time. This story is not told by Luke in a, as a, a mythical fairy tale that happened, you know, once upon a time. No, Luke gives very specific details of time, place, and person. It takes place when Mary's cousin Elizabeth is in her sixth month of pregnancy. Luke begins with that because in the verses prior to this in Luke's gospel, he has just told the story of the unexpected pregnancy that Elizabeth had when she thought she was too old to have a child. We may also remember that Elizabeth's child will be John the Baptist, the one who prepares the way for the coming of Christ. But Luke then goes on to name a specific angel, Gabriel, who brings the message to Mary. Gabriel was also the one who told Elizabeth that she was going to have an unexpected baby. Luke then tells us where this happened, Nazareth in Galilee, probably because it was such an out-of-the-way town 
that many would not know exactly where it was, Nazareth in Galilee. Then he names Mary, who is engaged to Joseph, a descendant of David. So Luke is telling all of this as historical narrative, not as a myth. So he grounds it in time and place with the names of everyone involved. Over the years, some have have questioned about whether the story of Jesus' birth was simply a myth, like some of the myths in literature in which, you know, the gods interacted with humans in some unusual ways. But as C.S. Lewis, who was also one of the foremost literary scholars of his day, he's reminded us, and he said, that the Gospels are not written in the form of myth but as true historical accounts meant to convince the reader that it really happened and it's really true. Lewis put it this way. Now, as a literary historian, I am perfectly convinced that whatever else the Gospels are, they are not myths. I have read and written a great deal of myths, and I'm quite clear that they are not the same sort of thing. However, when Luke tells this story, He not only sets it in a particular time and place, he also records some amazing dialogue, which could only have been passed along by Mary because she's the only human present. The angel Gabriel begins by announcing Mary is favored by God and that God is with her. Mary is obviously troubled by the visitation of an angel, as anyone would be, Mary is troubled here, I think, first of all, simply because of the appearance of the angel, even before she has heard most of what the angel tells her. The angel tells her not to be afraid, which is what most angels who appear in the Bible seem to say, fear not. Whatever angels look like, their mere appearance would probably terrify all of us. Gabriel reiterates that Mary has found favor with God, but more importantly, that she will give birth to a son named Jesus. Now, over my many years in ministry, I have preached on this passage a lot. I've been through a lot of Advents, but not too long ago, I was reading this and something jumped out at me that I'd never seen before. It had to do with what Gabriel tells Mary about who this Jesus will be. The angel Gabriel says these things about this child. He will be great. He will be uh, the son of the Most High, who is God. He will be given the throne of his father David, that's King David. He will reign over Jacob's descendants, the people of Israel. His kingdom will have no end. He is the Holy One, and he will be the Son of God. Mary, being a good Jewish girl who had been taught the Hebrew Scriptures, what we Christians now call the Old Testament, she would know that these were different ways of describing only one person. The Messiah sent by God, not only to all of Israel, but to the whole world. Her child was going to be the Messiah. So this is not just a story about the the miracle of a child being born to Mary who was engaged and who had not yet been married and not yet been intimate with Joseph as complex and as difficult as that might be by itself. No, this is first of all about Mary giving birth to the child who will be the Messiah sent by God to save the world. Now Mary does ask how this will take place because she knows how these things work. Gabriel explains it will be the miraculous work of God's Holy Spirit that will cause this to happen. Note that the Greek word used here does not lend itself to being some kind of divine human physical encounter found in some other mythical stories. No, the Greek word simply means that God's Holy Spirit will be present with her and cause this to happen, and nothing beyond that. But then comes the rather curious way that the angel Gabriel tells Mary about her cousin Elizabeth's unexpected pregnancy that God has brought about. Yeah, we may guess why that happened. You know, maybe Mary will later think that she's imagined this whole encounter with the angel. But if she goes to check it out with Elizabeth, which she does, then she will believe that it's really true, that it really happened. And finally, after hearing all of this, Mary says these amazing words. 
I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Mary's words indicate that she does have a choice in this matter. Gabriel did not say to her, well, this is what God's going to do to you whether you like it or not. Mary clearly believes she has a choice. And Mary courageously chooses to say yes. She will agree with what God plans to do. So, we have come and call this sermon series The Four Love Stories of Christmas. So, if this is a love story, where do you see the love in this particular story? Between whom do you find love? While this may not be the normal romantic love story, I think that if we look closely, we may see the story is filled with love. First of all, it begins with God's love for the world. As John's gospel reminds us, for God so loves the world that God sends God's only son that whoever believes in him will be saved. This story has its roots in the very beginning when God created a plan to deal with the sin and the brokenness and the evil in our world. This story begins with God's love for the whole world. Next, I think we see God's love for Mary. Gabriel twice tells Mary she's favored by God, that God is with her. God cares for Mary, enough to give her a choice with this whole plan. I believe that she could have said no, but she did not. God loved Mary. I think we also see the love of Gabriel, the angel for Mary, particularly in the way that he speaks to her. Gabriel does all he can to relieve her of fear and anxiety in telling her news, news that would be hard for anyone to hear. Tells her she's favored, that God is with her, and not to be afraid. Gabriel expresses his love for Mary. I also think we see Mary's love for God. Not only does she ask her questions about what God is doing in kind of a humble and respectful way, in spite of this being way outside of anybody's life experience. But she ends up saying yes, that she will do what God is requesting. She'll do her part to fulfill God's plan for her and, and for the whole world. And I think that implied in all of this is Mary's love for Jesus, who's yet to be born. If you know the story of the life of Jesus and how it affected Mary, it would not be easy raising this child born in this most unusual and to some socially unacceptable way. While Mary probably hasn't even thought about this yet, exactly how do you raise and, and parent the Son of God and the Savior of the world? And finally, to bring it full circle, I think Mary also, like God, Mary shows her love for the whole world. You see, the story is more than just about Mary's situation. While she heard from the angel Gabriel who this child is going to be, she knew that this was a once-in-history event that is at the heart of God's plan to redeem the whole world and everyone who has been and ever will be born forever. This is not just about her. This is about the whole world. So when Mary agreed, she was demonstrating a love for the whole world. I think there's love all throughout this story. But I wonder what it was like for the angel Gabriel as he told Mary all of this and waited for Mary's response. Author and Presbyterian pastor Frederick Beatner recreates that moment in this way. This is what he writes. She struck the angel Gabriel as hardly old enough to have a child at all, let alone this child. But he had been entrusted with a message to give her, and he gave it. He told her what the child was to be named and who he was to be and something about the mystery that was to come upon her. You mustn't be afraid, Mary, he said. And as he said it, he only hoped she wouldn't notice 
that beneath the great golden wings he himself was trembling with fear to think that the whole future of creation hung now on the answer of a girl. The whole future of creation now hung on the answer of a girl. Isn't it amazing how God works? God takes normal, everyday people like Mary, like, like you and me, and God asks us to be a part of God's plan to change the world, to bring hope into our world. So what is God asking you to do to bring hope into your world? What's God asking you to do to bring hope into your world? I believe that like Mary, God wants to do something through each one of us to make a difference in our world. To do something or many things that, that only we can do because of who we are, our gifts, our talents, our resources, our life experiences. What is God asking you to do to bring hope into your world. And more importantly, how will you respond? Friends, I believe the future of at least a part of your world may hang on your answer. In the strong name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are in awe of someone like Mary with her courage and her compassion for the whole world. Lord, help us to be open to what you are calling each one of us to do, to bring hope into a world that so needs your hope and your love and your grace. And give us the courage to say yes and to do what you ask. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus the Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Friends, if you've come here today as our guest, you may be looking for some hope in your life. Maybe you want to be a part of a community of faith that is trying to live into the hope that God has for them. If you want to find out what it means to be a part of this family of faith, what it means to be a, a follower of Christ, if you want to talk with somebody, I'm in the back at the end of the service. I would love to talk with you about those things following the service. Our charge this day is to live into hope. 
Pay attention to how God is calling you uniquely to bring hope into your world. Then have the courage to live into the hope that God is pointing you to head toward. Know that you do not go there alone, that God is with you. God will empower you to do anything that God wants you to do. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all.